Good afternoon, everybody uh, from the UK, and welcome to you wherever you're joining us from today. We're delighted to open up the webinar today to some of our previous panelists, and a big thank you to all of you who are agreeing to, agreeing to come back. Hopefully, everybody can see uh, can see all the festive um, faces uh, on the screen this afternoon. Um, and it can't have been too bad an experience uh, for you to agree to come back. So let me briefly introduce who we have um, on the webinar today. And we figured a map might be the best way to convey, uh, convey where everybody is. Um, I'm Deirdre Fulton. I'm a partner at Midas Aviation. Those of you who, who tune in regularly will, uh, will be familiar with my voice, um, perhaps not my face. So here I am. Um, we've also got John Grant, uh, OEG's Chief Analyst. Um, he's the one with the Santa hat, just in case you haven't worked that out. Um, desperately trying to make a noise with ringing the bells. Um, we'll go sort of uh, geographically. We're delighted to be joined by Marcel um, Lekkerk, who's Director of Route and Business Development at Schiphol in Amsterdam. Hello, Marcel. Uh, we have um, then going south, we've got Ogaga Ujo, who is Managing Director of ZA Logics, based down in South Africa in Joburg. Hi, Ogaga. Um, too hot for Christmas wear, I think, uh, down, uh, down there right now. Um, and then moving across uh, the ocean, we've got, um, uh, delighted to welcome back, um, Jao Pita, who's Head of Airline Business at Sao Paulo. Welcome, uh, Joe. How are you this afternoon? Um, then a little bit further north, we have Renee Armas Mays, um, who's based in Lima. Hello, Renee. And then um, sweating it out in the Caribbean there, uh, we have Jim, and that's I'm speaking from uh, a very cold Scotland, so a little bit of envy that uh, you're in uh, you're in nice conditions. Um, so we have Jim Heppel, who's uh, managing director of tourism analytics. And then lastly, but by no means least, um, we have Buddy Anslinger um, joining us from the States Director at Recondo. Um, thanks, Buddy, and thanks everybody for, for giving, up, uh, giving up your afternoon in what is a busy, uh, a busy time. So this afternoon, um, we are going to go through some of the slides that we normally do, but we've got a, a, a quite a compressed deck of slides today because we really want to just have a conversation um, both with you, the audience, uh, because we've um, asked you to submit some questions in advance. And thanks to everybody that's done that. We've, we've got lots to choose from. Um, and I'm sure we'll get lots of questions as we go this afternoon as well. Please, please do use the question box um, to engage with uh, the panel um, as we go. And, and we'll keep an eye on those as they come in and, and try and address them. Um, hey, it, it feels everybody like there might be a little bit of cautious optimism in, in the industry, and we'll get into whether that's um, overplayed or, or not. But, you know, in the UK, the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine started yesterday. A whole 5,000 people were vaccinated. It's a very small, small step, but it's, it's, a, it's a real step forward. Um, there's been a tentative relaxation in some parts of the world and in some countries of some of the lockdown measures. But equally, we've still got many, many countries um, under uh, under strict lockdowns. And we were just hearing from Marcel bef before we came live that the Netherlands is, is um, you know, is, is still in a, a, a real restricted uh, place. Australia, for example, also no closer to reopening for international travel um, and uh, bubbles and corridors um, cl closing before they, they open. So. You know, there's there's so much challenge still out there um, in the industry, um, and the you know the reality of a vaccine and and the implications of that are really what we want to get into um, this afternoon. So let's get on and do that. So um, first slide that we wanted to talk to you about. Now this is a little bit of a it's a depressing slide, I have to say. Um, we're showing you here capacity over the last twenty years. To really just illustrate that this is beyond anything, um, COVID is beyond anything we have ever seen. We we all know this, um, but it's a it's a stark reminder of just how big the challenge for the industry ahead is. You know, typically um, we all know that past major events, which were perceived as major events at the time, um, took approximately 12 to 18 months to recovery. Um, 
the, the, you know, with the best will in the world, um, we are not going to see that pace of recovery. And the question mark really is around what the industry will, will look like when we start to, um, to come out of this. John, anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, yeah. Comment. Can I can I add that um, these reindeers are available for anyone else to hire after today's uh, webinar? Um, <laughs> but um, we, um, you know, this this slide is just I think conveys exactly how deep this has, uh, event has become when suddenly, in the space of nine months, we've wiped out 20 years of uh, capacity growth in the whole industry. Um, it's pretty stark. It's pretty uh, pretty scary. Um, but I guess ultimately, you know, there there has to be that resilience. We know that this industry will will all uh, bounce back. Uh, but the damage and the destruction that's been done to not just airlines and airports and uh, the aviation ecosystem, but to individuals is is just beyond anything I think any of us could have experienced or expected to see. So it's uh, it's a it's a depressing slide, Deirdre. Move on quickly, please. <laughs> I don't know that this one's any less depressing. So what we're looking at here is indexed back to 2000 um, flight capacity growth and also um, average aircraft size and airport pairs. I get. I guess there's a. You know, there's there's. We were starting to talk, weren't we, last year and and in the the early part of this year about to what extent aviation growth uh, had gone beyond what was sustainable and was a reset of the market due. Um, now, nobody would have ever anticipated that this degree of um, reset would, would be what, have what would have happened. But it's interesting, I think, to, to, you know, if this hadn't happened, would we have seen um, structural change in, in, in the industry and in growth rates? That's, that's the unknown, isn't it? It is, and we probably we probably would have seen at some point an event because you know history tells us there are events and they come along sort of every decade. Something happens that causes a minor reset. Uh, but um, I I just intuitively sensed that we were probably beginning to overheat and that you know there was rapid growth coming along. And of course, some airlines have been caught with the wrong fleet mixes and um, too large an aircraft type that they can you know maintain operations with any degree of sort of certainty and uh, they're frantically looking for new aircraft. But I, I, I think the reassuring thing, Deirdre, is that in terms of the number of airport pairs that are being operated, um, you know, that has not declined as dramatically as some of the other um, measurements you're showing there, which means at least airlines are keeping minimal levels of connectivity. And that may have been you know, through the CARES Act and the US domestic program or KLM consciously saying we're going to fly to every destination uh, that we serve once a day, even if we used to serve it seven times a day. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think in the in the build out and the recovery, that is where I see some some hope. The fact that, you know, lots of airport pairs have still been operated. Um, clearly, if you're one of those that's lost your 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 one service or your two services, and if you're an island in the Caribbean, you know, that's particularly frustrating and, and you're starting again. But at least for most markets, the number of city uh, airport pairs operated has, has held up relatively well. Mm. Okay, let's move on to our usual uh, yellow, uh, yellow chart and, uh, and table here. Now, this is where we've been reporting um, every month the change uh, versus last year. Um, and it's, you know, we're, we're static pretty much, aren't we, at a global level? But there's, um, there are definitely moves, you know, it, it, and we've seen that throughout, haven't we, the last few months, that a, a, a move somewhere in the system is, uh, it, it is counterbalanced elsewhere in the world. And that's continuing, yeah, isn't it? It is. And we saw, we've seen in North America in the last couple of weeks, and particularly the US before Thanksgiving, that mm. capacity and you know, hopefully traffic picked up quite well. And at the same time, Europe went into a lockdown. So the two ended up balancing each other out and we ended up with 55 million, which is where we've been for, for quite some time. But um, Buzzy, I mean, that, that pattern in North America was a, a pretty consistent sort of pickup in capacity you see year on year, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Thanksgiving is traditionally you know, a four day holiday, very family oriented and 
people want to travel and go see their loved ones. And it's much like Christmas. It's a, you know, it's normal that it should go up much like Christmas. We'll see the whole world go up as much as, but it's all relative to what we're in this year. And so in January, you'll see all the capacity come back down uh, to what it should be relative to December and November and traditional years. So I, I think it's false optimism that it's, it heralds, you know, a change in capacity for the long term, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Deirdre, another one is Latin America, where if you look where they were in August, you know, it's, it's come back. Um, and I think the Brazilian market's been pretty strong and the domestic market's been pretty strong, hasn't it, Yao, in the last couple of weeks, months? Yeah, John, definitely. I think the domestic is, is quite strong at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of people that usually does holidays uh, internationally, just uh, traveling domestically. Uh, for a couple of reasons that everybody knows here. It's not only that the borders are closed, but also that the uh, people are feel safer if they just stay in the same country and within the country. So we are seeing the flows to the northeast side of Brazil, which is the more leisure driven, uh, very, yeah. very strong. Um, not only bookings, but searches. They are at 2019 levels for some of the cities above 2019 levels. So we are seeing the domestic really recovering fast. And just to, to add a note on, on the rest of Latin, of course, with Argentina opening uh, domestic services, JetSmart, Flybondi, they are starting to operate again, Chile as well. So we are seeing some movement and momentum in South America. And this is the summer. So, you know, some of the constraints that we are seeing in Europe with the winter coming, we are facing the opposite here in, in Latin America and I think we need to take advantage of that. Right and, and Rene what about for you in uh, Lima is it um, is that your perspective is there a bit of a recovery underway? Yeah it's, it's sort of the same I mean when comparing one time which is equivalent of the capacity in 2019 I mean Latin America capacity shows without any doubt a growing trend. Uh, for example the percentage why uh, when comparing the last two previous weeks this growth is led by Central America, like 2.1% up to 1.5 million seats. Moreover, the growth is led, obviously, in the north by the two Mexican wells, Sicari, you know, Vivero, Luz, and Polario, which are about 2.9%. And seat capacity this week, when compared to 2019 number, which is indeed impressive. And as we know, obviously, this is part of the reason that they, they did not close their airspace. So looking at the regional cities, you know, Central American city capacity has been fast and sitting at 63% when compared to January 2020. On the other hand, lower South America, lower South America, they are between 49 and 50%. And that's basically because what you all described, a number of borders coming up in Colombia and Peru. And Jim, in, in the Caribbean, I, I mean, you must be swamped with tourists coming down from the United States and Europe at this time of year, in a normal year. How's it, how's it looking now? Um, yeah, in a normal year, John, particularly with, as Buddy said, Thanksgiving. Uh, November would have been reasonably strong, but not this year. Um, you know, Aruba, for example, the airport just reported uh, it was running 32% in terms of arrivals compared to this November 2019. Um, Montego Bay running about the same, um, about 25% of what it ran in November uh, 2019. Punta Cana's running about the same. Um, so since the, the many of the islands opened up in July and August, uh, the recovery has been relatively slow and um, probably we're gonna see maybe 30, 40% of what we saw in um, December uh, for uh, compared to 2019. Right. And um, Agaga, I mean, interesting question already coming from Lei Lung, who said, um, using your crystal ball, ball, which airlines are in danger? I mean, where you are, South African Airways are in danger again and again and again and again. <laughs> yeah, so uh, also talking to this picture, um, today makes it about a year and a week since South African Airways was placed in business rescue, which is our version of Chapter 11. And a few minutes ago, they've actually appointed another interim board. So we'll see really how this pans out. But how this has impacted the numbers is that um, 
yes, we've had a mixed bag in terms of restrictions across the continent. Um, and around October, November is when international borders were opened. But the fact that major players um, have pulled out capacity and aren't operating due to restructuring reasons has, of course, impacted some of this ca capacity recovery. With that said, though, you find that um, other airlines are actually adding capacity, trying to fill that gap uh, where they didn't have the opportunity before. Um, so it really is a mixed bag across the continent, but from a restrictions perspective, um, Africa isn't really following quarantines. We're following more testing, um, you know, either pre, uh, pre departure or on arrival. And at least there seems to be some sort of um, standardization on, on that. But really, it's, it's an open market and whoever is ready and able to take up capacity and, and get that market share, they are deploying that capacity accordingly. And Marcel, in, in Amsterdam and Schiphol, you know, the my favorite airport and the the best route development team um and full of connecting traffic are you seeing any connecting traffic or is it all local mm. stuff at the moment well john thank you very much and uh, in fact we do see uh, on a very low level a lot of connecting traffic um basically it's the reverse of what we normally have because there are so few direct flights available uh, out of the few passengers we do have uh, the vast majority are actually connecting um, which is you know, the reverse of what we normally see. It's about mm -hmm. two thirds almost that now connect. Just um, to pick up on a question that we've had from Irina um, about the European impact, um, it, it is greater. Um, it's partly because um, there isn't a, a, a domestic market in Europe of the volume that there are in other regions. Think about um, China, India, uh, the US. These markets are all um, more resilient. Um, you know, China, in fact, the domestic market is now back into growth um, r rather than decline. So Europe doesn't, um, it does have domestic markets, but not of the scale that, um, that, that allow, um, you know, the gaps to be plugged, I guess, that, that have. Um, but Didri, um, is, an our prime, is, is our Prime Minister not having dinner with the President of the European Union as we're all part of one single market? Well, well, well yeah, let's not talk about that. 28 if, countries if, with if their only, different uh, quarantines and lockdowns. Only Brexit were, were, were the thing we had to worry about, John. Um, there, I've said, I've said that bad word. The other, the other thing, the other reality is that Europe has gone back into mostly lockdown. It's winter, um, you know, and and just as things were tentatively beginning to recover, we went into the the, the winter season, um, and that's having a, a huge impact on on carriers, um, and airports, and the, the industry across uh, across Europe. Um, Okay, any, I don't know that there's any more to say at the moment on this slide. Uh, let's move on to our next one. So those of you who are regular attenders will know that uh, we've been showing this slide chart on the left for some time now, really to illustrate, um, I think the only takeaway actually from this slide is that um, planning horizons are still short. Um, so what this is showing is that uh, each month the revision to capacity is significant. So, you know, back in April, there, there was a very optimistic, we're all going to come back out the other side of this very quickly. And that clearly, as the months have gone on, um, that pattern has, uh, has been repeated on a slightly smaller scale every month. Now, right now, uh, John mentioned, we're sitting at 55 million. Um, and we have been sitting at 55 million uh, pretty much week on week. Um, what's in the schedule at the moment um, projects up to uh, 66 million by the end of December. It's, you know, realistically, with everything that we know is happening, nothing is, is going to get us to that point unless there's some sort of Christmas miracle. Um, but I think it's very unlikely. So, um, you know, that short term planning horizon still, still, still is out there, still exists and is still um, compounded massively by there being so much uncertainty. You know, when, when you can't, when you, when the country that you're in still has, um, for example, you know, cross-border state restrictions or um, restrictions around where you can travel within your local area, um, then it's hard to envisage that you might 
be free enough to book travel with any degree of certainty for any period um, in advance. Although at least one of the panel, um, two of us actually have, have booked some travel for 2021, but maybe we're the optimists uh, in, the, in the panel. I don't know about the others. Um, you know, so, so this um, airlines are, are hampered massively, aren't they, by their ability to, to predict what is going to happen. We all know that there's pent up demand, but when when is that demand going to be um, going to be uh, realised? Is is the unknown? Do any um, of the, do any of our panelists see any upside from fifty five million by the end of the year? Buddy, no. Any thoughts? Not really. No. I mean, we're so close in. Uh, some of the airlines are tweaking uh, Christmas schedules uh, this week in the in the GDS loads, but we're so close in and. I can't imagine there'd be a huge change. No, I would say no, the same. I, I, sorry. You know, yeah, go ahead, Marcel. Um, if, if, if Christmas is going to show a peak, it, it'll be a very small peak. Um, like Buddy says, we are quite quite close in. Uh, people will want to travel. Um, it won't be from the Netherlands because we are discouraged from traveling abroad. Um, some people might visit us. So, um, at this late stage, I would only see a very a blip on the map. Mm. Yeah, I I would just add to this that uh, there is very different figures between domestic and international. So uh, big markets, and of course we have one big market. Of course, US is is much much bigger than than Brazil. Uh, South Africa is also a big market. But what we are seeing is that on the domestic side we have pressure on demand and now airlines need to to respond so they need to see how much capacity they, they can put in the system uh, and trade some fares by volumes but at the same time they have perhaps some aircraft constraints because they have them in, in long-term storage or even some crew issues by some of the carriers so you know how to balance all of this uh, at the end i'm not sure if you can go beyond the 55 million um, and if we see only if you zoom in only to the domestic i think we have some constraints industry-wise uh, as well as demand. On the international, no, I, I'm with Marcel. So it's mostly expats going back home and some, you know, some uh, people like myself. So I live in Brazil, but I'm Portuguese. I want, I want to go back home and vice versa. So, you know, I, I cannot see it go beyond that for the international traffic. Mm -hmm. and, and Jim, are you um, expecting tourists? Yeah, I mean, the not, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm on. The, the numbers for December, certainly the, the last, two weeks as we get into New Year's as well, that the hotels are reporting reasonable demand. But like Buddy says, in, in January, it really falls back again. But but I have a question for you, John. I mean, we're talking about capacity. Um, one of the interesting things I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with is the load factors. Um, Aruba's been reporting that for the US flights, the load factors have actually been declining since we reopened in, in September. They began at about 60%, and then in November they were down to 48%. And, and I, I think, I, Jim, you know, I think we, it's a really good point. I mean, we we think they're running anywhere between 15 and 20% below the capacity reductions. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's pre pretty dramatic in itself. But what we've seen in many markets is a really quick spurt of people who want to travel, visit friends and family, um, a bit of a bit of vacation if, if you time it correctly and then there is this whole sort of retrenchment back and lock the doors down and you know you get a window of opportunity of about two months and then there's there's another spike um, that's been going around and that that's made it really difficult for everyone I think and you know one of the great challenges of COVID-19 is every country in the world is in a different stage of its management of the event. I've, I've just got a feeling that, that some of the airlines are going to be looking in the first quarter at saying, well, we've reintroduced this capacity, but we're really not achieving viable loads and we might cut back. Don't forget I, some of the airlines and the load factors are somewhat artificially low because they're blocking yeah. seats. So you, you might yeah. see Southwest, uh, I think a full plane is only two thirds full. And so they reported load factor of like 67 or 70 percent mm -hmm. uh, if it was full. You know, and so I think some of those are, I can't remember which airlines are, are moving away from that. Yeah. 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 
I, I can tell you the Latin American side, if you look at the full service carriers, you know, if you compare benchmark that with Delta and Gaia, for example, and I'm talking about our Mexico Latin American side, and Sula, right? their third quarter 2021 factors were close to 70%, which was very good compared with a 45% for the US peers. Now, if you move to the ULCC uh, world, and if you benchmark all, uh, Viva the Boot Polaris versus ULCC peers, Swiss Air, Ryanair, and Spirit Airlines, same for the third quarter 2020, Latin American ULCC carriers were averaging 70 70% versus 69% for the other peers. So in both sides, you know, there are 25% higher and 8% points higher than the other one. Having said that, if you compare that with 2019 numbers, you know, Latin American carriers, full service carriers, they are 15%, uh, 15 points below, and ULCC carriers are about 10 points below. But they are doing quite, quite, quite well for now. I, I, I suppose the question, though, for airlines is to what extent are they taking a big hit on yield to um, to stimulate that kind of demand, you know, and, and how, well, we, we all know that's not necessarily sustainable, but in a world where customers have so, or passengers have so many barriers to travel, um, you know, working out where you can go, that you'll be able to do something once you're there, or um, that you'll be able to get back from, uh, you know, all, all of that complexity, the testing piece, you know, the, the, the I guess the push that the passenger needs to book travel, um, to what extent a, a, a lower fare will actually change that kind of behaviour? You know, we're used, we're used to using yield management as a way to, to, to stimulate demand. I'm not sure that um, I think airlines have been doing that, but I'm not sure that that's the whole story or that, that that's what, what we will need going forward. I think we we will have a, a an environment where um, the passenger's expectation of the types of flexibility that, that you know, when, when we are booking our 20, when 2021 travel, we want to know that we can rebook at short notice um, or that we can decide not to travel and take a voucher or, whatever we do um we need that kind of flexibility and i don't think that's going to go away and that's costly as well isn't it for for carriers for an airline territory but i mean you know isn't the whole thing as we were discussing this morning about we need to create a completely reassured and rebuilt level of confidence amongst travelers and you know that's everything from the travel booking process which you talk about flexibility to the tremendous work that airports have done in you know creating sterile environments and flows through airports uh, that makes a, a huge huge difference and then of course to everything the airlines have done to to ensure the safety of the whole process there is a complete re-education and pricing is only part of that whole equation you you, you mm -hmm. can't be left just to the airlines it you know it's it's a bigger story and a bigger message that needs to be got out I think if the Chinese market is analogous to the rest of the world, I mean, they've gotten people back on the planes by introducing really low fares. Um, it appears, you know, that people are back on the planes and ultimately, um, you know, each one has a, a good experience uh, theoretically and so that they're ready to travel again and again and again. And then that's when revenue management would kick in and start to raise in pricing and raise fares and, and manage lower fares off the plane. And so, I, you know, I, I, if that's a that's if that's a, a prototype for the rest of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that would seem to be the way forward. I, I would guess. And uh, and that you know, one of the questions we had was, is there a region that's doing it right and and you know, get, get, getting it, making travel work during a pandemic? Um, yeah, and I, I, I can't I can't I can't be the judge and jury of that. I'm just just yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. But you know, in, in terms of actually getting people on planes though and getting them yeah. to, to travel again. Yeah. I think um, that leads quite nicely into our um, into our last slide, which um, you know we saw this week a prediction from uh, Kotri, who are a research institute that specialise in, in China, on there being potentially 100 million Chinese outbound travellers in 2021. Now last year there were 169 million, so 
you know, this is a that's a substantial um, prediction about uh, about what might come. But if you look at the pattern of uh, how domestic travel has gone in China, if you can crack the you know the the problem about um, transmission of cases through vaccines or through um, protocols or a combination of those things, then you could potentially unlock um, you know the, the the massive revenue that this outbound market generates. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, it leads us into this whole conversation about um, vaccine uh, nationalism, you know, mm. and to, to what extent, you know, we've seen Al, Alan Joyce show his hand, haven't we, about, um, you know, Qantas uh, travellers will have to um, will have to be vaccinated. It, it, that leads me to say, is it for the airline to decide? Is it for the country to decide? You know, um, an airline might not mandate vaccination, but a country might on arrival. Um, and I think there's a, I think we're, we're almost, you know, we, we've got through the excitement of a vaccine, successful vaccines being developed. Um, there's a huge challenge ahead in terms of the distribution of those vaccines. And we could, you know, I think we should spend a bit of time understanding and talking to our panel about that. And then there's the implications of that in terms of what does it actually mean for for reopening international travel? Doesn't um, I mean? You know, I'll throw this out here. Isn't Alan Joyce stating, quite frankly, the very obvious? Um, because he has a duty of care to his own employees. He has a duty of care to his own national um, government regulators, port health authorities. You know, it it's a soundbite, but I, I think he's absolutely right. It's, and I know it's going to be really difficult in the recovery phase because that's going to immediately say to people, I can or I cannot travel. But at the very simplistic level, he has a duty of care to his employees who are checking people in and on board that aircraft. And having that in place just seems just seems obvious to me. What do you guys think? If, oh. if I may, from an African perspective, I think um, the continent and probably other emerging markets have been quite strong on that because there is inequality from a country bargaining power perspective. Mm -hmm. And for something to become a global standard, it means that everyone should have, or at least the majority of people should have fair and equitable access. So I think that in the long, in the medium to long term, almost a travel certificate similar to yellow fever will be required. Mm -hmm. But up until the point where there's a critical mass of people, especially in emerging markets such as Africa, it simply wouldn't be fair to apply a standard. Um, but then there is this gray area that we have to figure out on how, how do then how do countries now uh, impose restrictions on, on others, and of course how that impacts uh, the uh, total recovery. So I think that. It will become a standard, but maybe after 2021, when more people, especially in, in low income countries, have access to the vaccine. I, th I think one of the challenges, Ogaga, is that, um, you know, is, is, is exactly that in terms of the global standard ideal. And it is an ideal, frankly, because we have not seen a joined up global picture thus far in, in this pandemic. We have seen nationalism aplenty as con countries understandably you know to, to play to your point join john um close their borders without thought necessarily to the consequences of, of some of those actions and i'm i'm not convinced that we're going to see anything different on the other side in terms of um you know behavior around restricting travel because somebody either hasn't been vaccinated um or doesn't have the right vaccine Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think also, if I if I may, I mean, the, the sense I got when I, re I read about what Qantas was proposing was you really got to look at it in the Australian context, that mm -hmm. uh, the Australians are absolutely paranoid um, about importing infection. Uh, they've got very, very severe restrictions on their own citizens traveling abroad. And I think he was proposing this wouldn't go into effect until the middle of 21. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I know IATA basically said that they didn't think that that was, they thought it was a little bit premature. But I'm kind of with John, I think there's an inevitability about it um, once this initial excitement about who's going to get the vaccines is sorted out. Yeah. But I, I, I think, think it definitely, 
I definitely think it needs to be a national mandate from each country that, you know, in order to enter this country, that country, you have to be vaccinated. And, and yeah. Alan was simply voicing, hey, if you're going to get on Qantas, I mean, he's a policeman, right? Um, they're not going to face yeah. the Australian government at the other end, you know, and much like a visa or, or a yellow fever vaccination uh, in days gone by, or even today, you know, the airline has to police who gets on the plane to protect everyone on the plane as well as when they get to their yes. destination. If it's not a national mandate, then like a place like the United States and, and other countries with multiple airlines, half of them might say, oh, you can get on our plane without a vaccination. So what good is it, right? Yeah. And um, there are yeah, this one, I mean, uh, there was some news about the FAA uh, basically telling pilots and flight attendants not to, not to use, not to vaccine because they might be probably be risky in losing their licenses. Besides that, you know, I think that even if a vaccine is fully available in January, February, February by multiple vaccine providers, many people might decide to wait six to eight months to have a shot. And yeah. that would be an own imposed precautionary measure. You know, more yeah. we have pretty good news. And based on a survey that 50% of the US population is thinking it's waiting longer or not even vaccinated, which is a concern. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 is there just thinking for a moment about you know this this um the the reality is 2021 doesn't doesn't look good from uh, you know from anyone's perspective. Is there a window of opportunity for airlines to, in the same way that we saw the distribution of PPE providing a, you know, a, a real boon in terms of cargo activity, and um, particularly for airports and airlines, are we going to see the same thing in the distribution of vaccine? Is that is that something? Um, because in, you know, in a, con a continent like Africa, for example, Gaga, it has to be distributed by air, doesn't doesn't it, to some extent? Um, definitely, definitely, because the infrastructure is fragmented across the continent. And I think to your point, there's actually been some pretty positive news with two of the leaders in aviation. So in the last few days, Ethiopian Airlines actually uh, signed an agreement with Alibaba's um, logistics arm to develop a cold chain air freight um, capacity and solution. And this actually will assist in bringing a capacity and developing capacity to distribute the, the vaccine. Um, interestingly, 12 of the, they have 12 dedicated cargo aircraft, but they've converted 25 to actually support the distribution. And from a Kenya Airways perspective, they've also done a similar work in developing a pharma facility at the airport to support uh, this distribution. So from an infrastructure perspective, the leaders in the market are actually designing uh, and, and kind of like uh, 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 preparing themselves for this capacity. But of course, that'll take some time to distribute across the continent. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Uh, aviation can now finally show again uh, its value to society in getting the vaccines to people who need them. Uh, particularly in our part of the world, there's um, a lot of emphasis nowadays on the, on the negative effects that aviation brings in pollution and noise and emissions and all that. Now we can finally show what we are worth. We will bring the vaccines mm -hmm. to people that need them. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think Marcel just touched on a very important subject about the, the need for the aviation industry and this is airlines that are well prepared airports that are well prepared so the coal all the cold chain and uh, that, that is needed to transport vaccines either at minus 70 celsius or but zero celsius or plus five or plus ten so it's all a very complex logistic chain that we need to put together and uh, and uh, just uh, um, uh, tidying the, the nods uh, that we were talking before about uh, the long haul operations. I think the long haul operations in 2021 will need that cargo revenue more than ever. And so we need to have the, the cargo just feeding uh, and, and filling the belly so that we can have long haul operations because airlines won't sustain a 40% or 50% load factor for the next 12 months. And if they have that precious cargo on board, then they can just continue to have connectivity for passengers, and at the same time, just bringing us the vaccines that are that are much needed. So I think I, this will be a, a a keynote for aviation. I think to that point, you know, the fact that 
whereas the movement of PPE was a really urgent two two month, maybe three month sort of priority, and everyone was trying to grab whatever they can. You know, the supply chain and the logistics of this process suggest that that cargo capacity is going to be needed for probably three, five, however many years. So in terms of the cargo industry and its contribution to scheduled airlines, um, you know, suddenly it's a lot more valuable than it was. It's not going to be six times the normal rates as we saw in March and April. But if this stuff is moving at two or three times the previous rates and it's regular shipments, for some airlines like Emirates and, and others who've got quite large cargo fleets, uh, this is a good space to be in. So, so you know, there's an opportunity, isn't there, for aviation to to prove its worth if it needs to, if it ever needed to, um, to, mm. to, to on a global stage. H how do we shift then from, you know, being in the right place at, at the right time to getting to a point where there is a joined up government um, approach and set of global standards about what, what travellers can, can expect? Because it feels like we're still a long way away from that. You know, it feels like the, the, the barriers that you have to overcome when thinking about planning travel are still too great. Um, and that kind of diminishes all of the, the great work that's going on on the ground um, and in the air to make it safe and to reassure us all that it's safe. How, how do we, how do governments get this right? How globally, how do we get this right? I think they have to learn to to trust each other and to to accept each other's standards and each other's uh, approaches, and that that is still missing even within a union like the European Union. Every single member state uh, is responsible for its own health policy, and you see mm -hmm. you see the results. Uh, Britain's just come out of a four-week travel ban. Uh, here in this country, we have a negative travel advice not to go anywhere except well, uh, Jim Aruba at the moment. Uh, it was Curacao last week. Um, so that, and that also illustrates the, uh, the fragility of it. I wonder, I wonder to what extent in, you know, in the life cycle that we've seen of how governments deal with the pandemic, you know, we've, we've been in crisis mode for a number of months, haven't we? You know, governments around the world. And it, it's, there's the dealing, there's the health crisis, I guess, and then there's the employment crisis and the economy crisis. But but it's, you know, we need to shift from firefighting into developing a, a sort of strategic model for how we operate going forward. And I think as long as governments are still in um, that firefighting mode, it's really hard to step back out of that, isn't it? And, and visualize where we need to get to. It is, Deirdre, and I think, you know, um, as you've got on on this slide, the the biggest challenge is, and the people who perhaps hold the key to this are those hundred million Chinese outbound travellers, international outbound travellers, because they're not going to travel until we get some processes in place and we've got some sort of health certificates and other such things. And you know, we've we've got to find a breakthrough moment, and I can't see it coming from anywhere else other than China at this moment in time and whether we like that or not personally you know that is they're probably going to be the people who are going to lead in terms of some certification process and perhaps the rest of us will follow because you know we haven't seen anything from uh, ICAO, IATA, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, any of these big global entities that uh, sometimes we we look to for advice and wisdom and and it's been sadly um, you know, it's been lacking in its um, in its outputs. We don't see that proactivity. Um, we we basically see them counting on governments to do stuff. And we cannot continue to do this. They they are then protect their members and they are there to provide guidelines and solutions for the airlines and it seems they are all basically begging on money loans or whatever you want to call it and we don't see that harmonized protocols you know and guidance that can be applied internationally you know across borders so we have one common solution at least a baseline where people can go beyond that where you mean we have to meet the minimum 
That's a buggy. Yeah, buddy, you were going to say something, and then Agaga, you had a comment as well. Oh, I, I just was uh, in, in this slide. I, you know, I, I was just going to observe that I hope 100 million Chinese uh, do travel overseas, but it is also they have to have some place to go. Um, and if all the countries are still in lockdown and haven't gotten advice from who, uh, the WHO or IATA or anybody else, you know, there's their options are limited. Yeah, Agaga. I just wanted to uh, echo your sentiment, John, um, about the discussion on trade-offs. And I think that's something that we've seen here in the continent. So because of the massive economic trade-offs that governments in emerging markets have to make, it seems as if um, you know aviation and tourism has almost been left to the side where it isn't fully appreciated that these are uh, important economic activities versus peripheral to these economies. And the way that the response has been structured Aviation only came about uh, after significant lobbying efforts, and I think that's where there's quite a loss in the continent, and it's really fragmented in terms of the uh, response. And further, the recovery, I think, will actually be delayed purely because there isn't an appreciation of the role that aviation plays, not just from a tourism perspective, but in terms of supporting uh, global supply chains. Mm. John, John, if I may, I mean, the Caribbean's a bit of a microcosm of what's going on globally, if you like, um, because we have a number of destinations which have put in place very, very rigor rigorous controls, um, protocols. And then on the other side of the coin, we've had Mexico and the Dominican Republic, which have decided to basically pursue a very flexible, if you like, kind of... Uh, I won't say relaxed, but certainly much less rigorous set of protocols for visitors coming in. And it looks as though there's a sort of a basic decision to divide the traveling market into two. There are those passengers who are very concerned about safety and that's their primary concern. And then there are others who say, I'm going to take a risk. Uh, price is more important to me. And that's what Mexico and the Dominican Republic seems to be uh, have decided to do. And it, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, to come up with a coordinated overall policy when you when you've got that kind of segmentation. So what, Jim? Just out of interest, what yeah. sort of people are, are they attracting? It are, is it you know people like myself, young, disposable income, <laughs> uh, all of those sort of people, or is it is it more the um, the more mature, sophisticated, experiential traveller? Who who is more concerned about safety? No, uh, no. Who who are Mexico and the Dom Rep attracting? I, I, is it they tend to be the younger traveller, if you like. Their their their, their demos tend to skew younger, um, and to a certain extent less affluent. Um, I mean, particularly the Dominican and Mexico, Cancun, um, to a certain extent, Los Cabos. You've got a tremendous amount of all-inclusive properties that you can keep the visitor within the resort, if you like, so to minimise local exposure. So I can understand some of the logic. Um, here in Aruba, we tend to attract an older kind of uh, visitor, de de demo skews older, and they're more concerned about safety. And, and so, so I, 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 can, I can see that our policy is going to be very much about protecting the visitor, protecting the local population. So we had an interesting discussion yeah, where we said, because the vaccine's being given to the elderly first, you know, are we asking... Are we then, John. Sorry? Oh, he's too young. Yeah, I am too young. Um, <laughs> you know, so so um, if the elderly are getting the vaccine first, does that actually mean we're going to see a flip here and suddenly silver surfers and all of those people who've been locked down for nine, 12 months, you know, with friends, family on the other side of the US or uh, in Australia from Europe or wherever it happens to be, suddenly they're going to, are they going to crawl out the woodwork and there could even be a demand for premium business traffic as they as they see the extra space as a, as an, an element of safety whilst on board. What what do you guys think? Well, I think I think that's possible. Equally, one of the advantages of catering to that segment is they tend to be more affluent. Also, they've got more disposable income. And and we'll just take to add on what uh, what what Jim just add on, on what Jim was saying. So the the um, when we see the trend on international traffic from Brazil, so we see Mexico, particularly Cancun and the Republic of Dominican and, and other places in Central America and the Caribbean islands as, as one of the, uh, we can say the bright spots at the moment, not great, but better than others. And, and so I agree with, with, the, with the, the rest of the, 
of the panel here. So we have uh, origins and destinations. So the yeah. one question is what destinations we'll do. So Caribbean islands, I think, are, are a very good one, or Cape Town, or, or even the Northeast Brazil. What are they doing? Are they closed or open? And then is the origins. And I think different societies have different uh, behaviors. Yeah. So if we see the Chinese and Chinese want to travel, the same applies to Brazilians. So they are traveling. And I can tell you, Sao Paulo is, is very different from Northeast. It, it yeah. appears almost like a different country. So yes, Brazilians, they are willing to travel. And so as soon as US borders are open or European borders are open, and of course, countries are not on a lockdown, they will travel. Of course, not as much as 19 for various reasons, but there will be a significant amount of traveling. And so we need to see what, what will be the next bright spot. So for instance, ecotourism might be a bright spot in the future so we can see more traveling to Zambia or to to Kenya for for safaris or we can see Patagonia arising as, as a good destination for ecotourism or a Katama desert or some of the smaller islands in the Caribbean so what will be the bright spots in the future because people will want less dense destinations so and perhaps the 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 bigger cities destinations will have a, um, a downturn in terms of, of flow of tourists which is also good because over tourism was there in 2019 and I don't see it coming uh, for a, for now a, a long time. Yeah. I think that's I think it. Some, the yeah, real issue, isn't it? Here is, um, is that from a, a trend perspective, and I think it might increase more, is that there's a stimulation or at least promotion of domestic tourism. So yeah, for a couple of reasons, people don't necessarily want to travel far, they don't want to interact with people, but also we are seeing economic challenges and disposable incomes are, are challenged. So you wouldn't want to spend that much money um, traveling. So you're seeing a lot of road trips around the country and the continent, you're seeing a lot of do uh, domestic travel uh, to a point where people weren't necessarily doing this before. And I think that is a whole segment that um, will support recovery from a domestic uh, uh, aviation perspective, but it will also uh, create some new trends in terms of focusing on domestic products and regionalization of, of the, the tourism product. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks, Ogaga. Someone's made a good point, um, Grant uh, Gray, thank you um, about the work on a digital health passport um, plan. I think there, there is a scheme uh, called Common Pass, which is a digital health um, passport. That I think about 25 countries have signed up to so far. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it, it's encouraging that there are steps um, afoot. And I think I want to see the World Economic Forum are behind, uh, are behind that. Um, so, you know, there, there is an appetite to, to get us to a point where there are a common set of standards and, 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 a, and a place that people can know that, yes, it's got this stamp on it, that, that, means, that means it's safe to travel or that the standards um, will be applicable uh, globally. Um, I, get, I guess what, you know, what, what all of that points to is um, how will we see different segments of the market res respond to that? You know, you can see that for the leisure traveller, um, there may be certain um, certain demographics or certain markets, like you described, uh, Joe, uh, about appetite to travel, just being there and waiting simply for countries to to open. Um, and we know that that leisure travel will come back um, uh, in some cases. But what about business travel? What what? How is that going to pan out? Um, you know, by the by not. Two months on from now, three months on from now, we will have had a year of no of no travel um, for business or very limited travel for business. Is is that going to continue? Is there is there an appetite from big corporates to get their sales force back on the road? I think, or I think business has to get back out there. Um, if 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 um, if I, I, I was involved last week with the Roots Connected Forum. And, and it was great to talk to airlines from all over the world again, but nothing substitutes for face-to-face -face travel. I mean, face-to-face -face meetings. And um, I forgot who said it, perhaps at Bastion Delta? I, I can't remember. That the first company that misses out on a sale because they weren't at a client's office, they'll be on planes the next day, right? And I think uh, the world corporations, businesses all over are ready to go. And so I, I, I but I think that 
on a on a personal level as well as on a company company level they fall into different categories of people as jim was alluding to um some companies will be more eager than others to put their their yeah. powers on planes so and maybe we can uh first of all i miss to to have a couple of beers with uh, with buddy and the others at the yeah. roots event so that that's a <laughs> exactly. big part and that's a big piece of uh, a couple yeah <laughs> that's a, that's a big piece of the conference and uh and, and the networking side but that buddy has mentioned I, I think we 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 can divide this in a couple of uh different layers of business one is conferences and fairs yeah. and i think that is a big big piece of that so the big textile and the big electronics uh, vegas all the fairs in china or for the chinese market and in europe let's say air cargo europe and, and the others so not only in aviation but all all streams of industry that that's a very big portion of of uh, business traveling and that will depend of course on national national legislations and the vaccines and all of that but that will come back so i'm not seeing people trading equipments or or you know all of that without affairs and without innovation uh, workshops and all of that so that will certainly come back then we have the more one-to-one -one business trips and, and that i think is tricky in the beginning but as buddy mentioned i think they will come they will come back sooner or later but they will the one piece that we need to think about is intra companies so very large multinational when they do let's say those get togethers in their headquarters two once a year twice a year four times a year will they continue to do it? Or will they just focus instead of four a year, one per quarter, let's do one face-to-face -face meeting a year and all the others will be gotcha. online or not. So yeah. where I see the, the question mark is on a, the inside the same company, inside the same organization, what will happen? Yeah. 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 No, I'll follow that. Uh, it will be exactly like that, as, but I, I would expect, and that's why, in total, business travel will probably rebound a bit slower than, than leisure travel for those reasons. And you can see that that across those different segments that you described, you know, there may be an element that that, that never comes back fully in the in the shape or the way it was uh, it was before. Um, I'm conscious yeah. of time. We we have a we have just a few minutes left. Um, we can take another question or we can we can have some parting uh, parting reflections uh, from you who has a who has a burning desire to tell us that I, it's all going to be okay let me ask a, a, a question of the panelists because you know they collectively between them have hundreds of years of experience um in the industry and can't believe i've got buddy jim and marcel who i've worked with for many years in different ways all on the same video call and we all must be getting ready for retirement. Um, when, but, you know, seriously, when do we think there will be a, a, the recovery will begin? And more importantly, when do we, what's our expectation of when we'll get back to 2019 levels or will we ever get back? Uh, Buddy, I mean, you're, a, you're very close to well, I think. Well, I mean, I think we're all very excited about the, the, the introduction of the vaccine, but unfortunately, you know, it's not like a light switch. And so I, I don't see us really traveling for some time, like six to nine months, for example, before enough people have uh, heard, heard vaccinated immunity, I guess you'd say, and, and the comfort to travel. And so unfortunately, I, I don't see us all, like things changing in the first quarter, or second, maybe the end of the second quarter being a third quarter. And in terms of back to normal, I mean, I don't think it'll be in 21 at least, it, at least 22 or 23 even before we're back to normal yeah i'm asked uh, i do i do think uh, at some point in the future we will surpass the the level of traveling yeah. that we had in 2019. Uh, i don't know exactly when it, it might take a few years and when we do reach that volume it might be different of composition uh, as we mentioned before probably even more leisure travel and slightly less business travel um for next year i'm a little hopeful uh but particularly towards the second half of the year I, I don't think we should have too many hopes for the first half of the year it's just too early that we see any significant increase in in travel um hopefully we can salvage uh summer peak here in europe uh, july and august that, that will be good for the entire travel chain um but there's a lot of work to be done yeah i mean every, every 
everything that I've seen suggests it's going to be probably 24, maybe even 25 before we get back to where we were in 2019. Um, that's assuming that there's no other event that happens um, between now and then. But, you know, like everybody, um, I, I'm not very confident about what's going to happen in the first half of 21. But I'm hoping that by the end of 21, we're going to be about 60% of where we were in 2019. And then it's going to grow in 22 and 23. And, uh, you know, as I say, probably 24, 25 by the time we get back to where we were. And Jim, you're talking about the travel industry rather than Newcastle United's performance in the Premier League, I presume. Oh, moving, moving swiftly. Uh, on. What about you? How do you, um, <laughs> how do you see the, the world? So I, I, I echo the same sentiments. I, I think um, I'm cautiously optimistic for the last quarter of next year and the year thereafter. But I think if I can talk from an Africa perspective, I do think we're going to take some time. Um, we must acknowledge that we had some structural deficiencies from an aviation perspective and all COVID did was aggravate that. Um, I think there will certainly be players that don't come back, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But uh, travel, uh, or aviation rather, is not as commoditized in Africa as it is in other parts of the world. And I think that will certainly have bearing on the recovery uh, timing, as well as the structure of the market uh, in the next few years. And the guys in Latin America? Yeah, in 50. Yeah, in 50 seconds, you know, it's the, the same in some of the countries here. It's not as commoditized as it is in the US or Europe. So I, we could see domestic markets uh, coming back uh, faster, of course, uh, not as fast as China, but I would say much faster than US and Europe. Uh, international will lag for a couple of uh, quarters or a couple of years. And that will depend also on, on one big question mark is what will be inter-Latin market because that is a, a world to explore inside Latin, the number of connections, the number of direct destinations and perhaps COVID will speed up uh, a couple of direct destinations that, that we need to have and we need to bring to the system and that will foster connectivity. And uh, Renan? Yeah, you know, besides an international travel speaking, remember that Latin America Five out of those top 10 countries with most COVID death by 100,000 population, which might further increase fears and anxiety to travel. So, uh, unfortunately, I mean, I don't see anything happening really happening before the fourth quarter of 2021. Uh, remember that those countries with the largest domestic market obviously will come on top. And one market that we have to really watch in Latin America is those connecting hubs that connects more than 70% of the, the, the traffic mm -hmm. might be Panama. Mm -hmm. So at least two years for domestic traffic to sort of recover at 70% and international market is going to take four or longer, another two years. And Deirdre, I think there's one last question that we really should answer, which is from, ironically, the last question, Magdalena is asking, what advice would you give to the <laughs> aviation graduates that are supposed to enter the industry in 2020? Uh, I guess one of the answers is, have you looked at medicine? Um, it's a fantastic industry with lots of opportunities. Absolutely. You know, I, you know. yeah, more seriously, last week I was lecturing to a group of students um, at Surrey University, and quite frankly, it's been a horrible 2020, but in terms of the industry, this is a really exciting moment in time in terms of new opportunities, how the industry is going to shape, um, you know, what routes are going to be flown by who and when. And, you know, the industry needs quality graduates to come in and help us through this crisis, be they from a data or an engineering perspective. Um, and for all of us, you know, it's been a fascinating career and we're in it because we love it. And if you can find a way in, get there as quick as you can. On that positive note, I think uh, I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you so much to to the panel for all of your thoughts and insights. Thank you for sharing uh, those with us so so freely. It's very much appreciated. We'll be back in the new year um, sometime in January. Uh, we'll we'll uh, regroup and um, set up uh, set up the next of the webinars. But until then, um, thank you everybody for uh, for joining. There's a short survey that we're going to send out to you um, afterwards and hopefully 
um, no one will be able to hear John's bells uh, on his reindeer antlers ringing over uh, <laughs> over the video that we'll also be sending out to you. Um, but please take time to fill in the survey uh, if you can. It'd be great to just um, to, to get some feedback on your thoughts about the industry uh, going forward. And um, very, very best wishes for uh, the remain the remainder of December with whatever whatever you're doing in whatever part of the world that you're in. Um, thank you, everybody, and thank you, panel. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to wear a Christmas sweater. <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.